What's going on, Philadelphia Christian families? We're glad to see you here where we worship in spirit and truth. Let's get it. Tuesday nights, join us for Bible study where we go deeper in the Lord, 7 p.m. Come and bring your burdens before the Lord at noonday prayer, Monday through Friday at 1215. Join us for the school of prayer on Thursday nights at 615. Saints of God, we want to invite you to Philadelphia Christian Church's nursing home ministry. It takes place today at 145. It all starts at 2 p.m. So we want you to come on out. The scripture talks about it says that when I was sick, you came and you visited me. And if you've done it for the least of these, you've done it for him. We thank you for joining us here at Philadelphia, where we worship in it's spirit. It's leaning, it's leaning in my direction, in my direction. Oh, it's worship time. It's leaning in my direction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, y'all ready to praise him. Come on, give God some glory one more time tonight. <laughs> glory. I just want to welcome all visitors for coming out tonight on Bible study and worship with us in spirit and truth. Give God some praise for all the visitors, members. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we want to welcome y'all in tonight. Hallelujah. We're going to make God look good tonight. We're going to lift his name up tonight. Amen. Amen. From the earth, he said he will draw all men. That's our presence, that he will draw us into his presence today and that we leave here with a blessing. Amen. Amen. Come on, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I am redeemed, I am redeemed. By, the by the blood of Jesus. How many of y'all excited about the blood today? <laughs> the Bible says that's the blood. Because of the blood, our sins are forgiven. And that's what we're going to celebrate tonight. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Say, I'm covered in the blood tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, put your hands together like this. Hallelujah. Very simple song. I want y'all to follow us. Here we go. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that saved my soul. That saved my soul. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that made me whole. That made me whole. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that covered. That me. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that set me free. That set me free. Tell them what it was. It was the blood of Jesus. The blood. The blood of Jesus. The blood. The blood of Jesus. The blood. The blood of Jesus. It was the blood. The blood of Jesus. Power in the blood. The blood of Jesus. Hey, the blood. The blood of Jesus. Look it up. The blood. The blood of Jesus. Come on, y'all. Put your hands together like that. Hey. Come on, some more tracking the monitors. Come on, we serve a good God. If you happy to be free because the blood, somebody make some noise. We gonna sing that again tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, ah, ah. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that saved my soul. That saved my soul. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that made me whole. That made me whole. I, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that covers me. That covers me. I know. I know it was the blood that set me free. That set me free. Tell them what it was. The blood of Jesus. The blood. The blood of Jesus. The blood. The blood of Jesus. The blood. The blood of Jesus. Everybody lift it up. 
Shout tonight. Where would we be if it wasn't for the blood? Wonder working power in the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's the blood of Jesus that brings change in this household tonight. Hallelujah. There is power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. If you know it, come and sing it. There is power.
every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. set free is free indeed we give you praise that he who is dead in Christ is free from sin God we thank you for freedom you came to set us free we thank you Lord God where the spirit of the Lord is there's freedom Lord God we give you praise for our freedom in Christ oh God we thank you we've been made free from the law of sin and death Lord God God we give you praise Lord God we declare that freedom reigns in this place Lord God freedom from sickness God Freedom from sin, Lord God. Freedom from stress, Lord God. Freedom from oppression, Lord God. Freedom from Satan, Lord God. Freedom, Lord God. Freedom, 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 Lord God. God, we speak freedom over marriages right now in the name of Jesus. Free to get along. Free to love one another. Free from arguments and free from spirits, God. We declare freedom over bodies right now, God. Free from headaches and backaches, Lord God. Freedom from diabetes. Freedom from cancer, Lord God. Freedom from AIDS and HIV, Lord God. Freedom from dementia, Father God. Freedom from Alzheimer's, Father God. Freedom from arthritis, Lord God. Freedom from heart disease, Lord God. Freedom, Lord God. Hallelujah from sickness, Lord. Physical and mental, God, we thank you, Lord God. We give you praise. Freedom from poverty, God. Free to be blessed tonight, Lord God. God, I speak it over your people right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, God. And freedom from sin, Lord God. God, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, your presence come down here, God. And bless us, Lord God. We pray, God, we have a tangible expression of your presence here. We pray you bind the enemy out and loose your spirit in, Lord God. 
We need you tonight, Daddy. Come on in like a fog up in here. Spirit, break out. Break our walls down. Come on now. Hallelujah. We need King Jesus tonight. Hallelujah. We pray you do like to us, God, when you, that you did to the donkey, Lord God. Hey, God, you told his disciples, loose him. Set him free. For the Lord had need of him. God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. You set some people free tonight. For the Lord had need of him. We pray they come in like the Gadarenes, the man of the Gadarene. Filled up with all manner of wickedness, God. But when they meet Jesus tonight, we pray they be set free, Lord God. That they be sitting clothed in their right mind after tonight, God. In the mighty name of Jesus. So, Father, bless the word and, and bless us, Lord God, in our prayers and, and bless everything we do. We pray you save somebody, you build people up, God. We pray the worship don't stop because the music stopped, God. But that we would worship you in spirit and in the truth, Lord God. That when we open our Bibles, it'd be an act of worship, Lord God. So, God, deal with us. Conform us into your image, God. Make us how you want us to be, God. Give us a word in due season. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give God some glory. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can somebody say, I hear the chains falling? Somebody say, I hear the chains falling? Hallelujah. Can y'all sing that one time, Philly? Huh? Come on, can y'all sing that? I hear the chains falling. Come on, come on. You got to believe it. You got to believe it tonight. Come on. Hey. I hear the chains falling. Hallelujah. Every chain that's on your life is falling tonight. Come on, help me. I hear the chains falling. I don't care what kind of chain you walked in. Hallelujah. Come on. I hear the chains falling. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. I hear the chains falling. You gotta shake them off. You gotta shake them off. That's right. I hear the chains falling. One more time, baby. Come on, one more time. I hear the chains falling. Come on, give God some glory, saints. Woo! Woo! Hallelujah. Shake them chains off. Shake them chains off. Shake them chains off. Shake them chains off. Hallelujah. No more shackles. No more chains. No more bondage. I am free. I am free. <laughs> oh, goodness, Lord. Hey, if y'all could have do that, we would have done that too, B. Yeah, we can do oh. that. Uh, I better let y'all go. Yeah, I better let y'all go. What you say, babe? What you say, babe? You want that no more shackles, no more chains? Say it, B. Say it. Just say it, B. No more shackles, no more chains. Oh, they like it. No more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Oh, you got something on that, B. Oh, you got something on that. Like that. <laughs> no more shackles, no, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, you gonna sing that one more time. Here we go. Say no more. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Somebody dance the dance of freedom and say hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I've got joy, hallelujah. I've got free, hallelujah. I've got break, hallelujah. I've been hallelujah. 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 Hall
Hallelujah, hallelujah, no more sickness, no more pain, no more back, no more foot, no more head, hallelujah, 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 who the son sets free, is free, indeed, hallelujah, 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 come on, somebody make it, yeah. hallelujah, <laughs> wow, wow, Woo. so long, bye, bye, hey. <laughs> so long, bye, 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 you might as well go ahead. Go so <laughs> bye bye. Say goodbye to my heartache. Bye bye. Say goodbye to my pain now. Bye bye. Somebody wave me bye bye. Bye bye. Somebody wave me bye bye. Bye bye. Say goodbye to my foot pain. Bye bye. Say goodbye to my knee pain. Bye bye. Somebody wave me bye bye. Bye bye. Somebody wave me bye bye. Bye bye. Say goodbye to my fear now. Bye bye. You ain't Bye bye. Say goodbye <laughs> to my fear now. Bye bye. You ain't welcome you. here. Bye bye. Somebody wave me bye bye. Bye bye. Somebody wave me bye bye. Bye bye. Somebody wave me bye bye. Bye bye. All right, y'all, we got it. <laughs> <word. laughs> wow. I feel another one, but we're gonna stop. Gonna gonna stop. <laughs> Y'all cut up. Y'all cut up. Y'all cut up. Wow. Woo. My goodness. Y'all enjoy that? Well, Miss Denise don't want to sit down just yet. Hallelujah. That was good. That was good. Yeah, man. I, yeah, sometimes you just got to praise him for just a little while longer. Just got to praise him now. Hallelujah. That was good, saints. Hallelujah. So, Father, we thank you for putting a spirit of praise upon us. We thank you that praise confuses the enemy, God. We thank you that praise is a weapon, Lord God. We thank you that when David was praising and worshiping, that devils had to flee, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that praise, hallelujah, hey, God, puts the enemy in confusion. So, Father, bless us now, God. As we open up your Bible, let the worship continue, Daddy. We pray you be lifted up, God, and you draw all men unto you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, give God some praise in this place. Hallelujah. Well, saints, if you will, just open your Bibles up with me to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15. And we're going to get cranked up. Amen. And you know, while you're turning, just a few announcements. Um, I guess the first announcement is, is that we are having prayer on Thursday. Amen. And after prayer, is going to be followed by a meal. And that meal is going to be brought to you by none other, none other than heavy weapons. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And some people say, man, that's funny for a church to have uh, a weapons place uh, sponsoring their meal. Well, that should tell you what kind of church we are. That's number one, amen? And number two, we believe the Bible, where Jesus told his disciples that a time would come when they'd have to buy him a sword, amen? And we don't feel there's nothing wrong with protecting your loved ones, your wife, your children, amen? And it's even more important for you to know how to do it without harming anybody, amen? And so that's why we believe in heavy weapons. We believe in education, amen? You can go and learn how to, how to take care of yourself, amen? and your family, hey, God, without any accidents happening. They also provide conceal and carry licenses, amen, and so you can go there and get everything that you need. Come on, give God some glory, amen. That's Brother Heavy, Dion Henderson, and his wife, Trish. That's their business, and, and God is good. He's raising up businesses in Philly. Friday night, saints, is the marriage ministry. Come on, let me hear you. Hallelujah. 
So we're going to get together and continue to move down through the Kingdom Marriage book. Amen. And, uh, every chapter, Tony Evans just blesses us. And so we're going to continue along those lines. Now, you have to be married to, to show up on Friday night. Amen. However, glory to God, uh, if you're married and your spouse is not there, you can still come. Amen. And maybe take some notes and stuff like that. But it's going to be an awesome night. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Any other announcements, love? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Just wanted to inform y'all, amen, that uh, I got another call, amen, from the pastors that's getting together on the Hebrew doctrine, amen. And uh, we're going to be doing what's called a Negro Land tour, amen, where we're going to be having conferences all across the United States. And our first conference is next month is going to be in North Carolina, amen. And so we're getting it together and we're going to be moving around. And so, uh, hey, God, y'all be in prayer uh, for me and for these brothers, amen, as we go to awaken the dry bones, amen. Come on, give God some glory, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, listen, let's go ahead and start it off looking at 2 Samuel 15, and we want to start around verse 23, and I'm going to read a little bit, and then we're going to kind of go. And uh, this service is going to be like a, a line-by-line study, Amen. I got a lot prepared, probably more than what we're going to need tonight. So just at a particular time, I'm going to go ahead and shut it down. And uh, hopefully we can get uh, uh, pretty far. Let's look at verse 23. The Bible says, and all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. And lo, Zadok also and all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God, and Abiathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. And the king said unto Zadok, carry back the ark of God into the city. If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again <clears throat> and show me both it and his habitation. But if he does say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here I am. Let him do to me as seemeth good unto him. The king said also unto Zadok the priest, Art thou not a seer? Return into the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahamas, thy son, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness until there come word from you to certify me. Zadok, therefore, and Abathor carried the ark of God again to Jerusalem, and they tarried there. Father, that a blessing to the reading, the hearing, exposition of your word. I pray that I decrease and you increase. Shake me once again, O king. Fill me once again, O king, that your people can hear your voice and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Saints, we've been in 2 Samuel. Amen. We've been in 2 Samuel for a while. And if good Lord spell life, we're going to be in 2 Samuel. For a while, because we just going line by line and precept upon precept. <clears throat> well, in this book, Second Samuel, we observe Absalom kill his brother Amnon, uh, and he killed Amnon because Amnon violated Absalom's sister Tamar. Uh, Absalom fled to his grandfather's house. He stayed there about three years, if y'all remember. Joab wanted him to come back because he saw that David missed Absalom. So Joab uh, concocts a scheme with a woman of Tekoa, and they tricked David into bringing Absalom back, and it wasn't for David's good. As soon as Absalom got back, he began to usurp authority. He began to try to steal the kingdom right from under the feet of his father, and, um, and that's what he does. We talked about Absalom stealing the hearts of Israel with pretended goodness, pretended greatness, pretended humility pretended religion and pretended numbers. And last week we saw that a messenger came to David and told David, Absalom, hallelujah, he's taken all the people of Israel, all the men of Israel with Absalom. And um, we began to talk about something we call David's flight. It's him actually fleeing Jerusalem, hallelujah, the city in which he pretty much uh, uh, liberated and built. So David has to leave the city. And he leaves the city because he don't want the city to be subject to a siege. He don't want war at Jerusalem. So he leaves. He submits himself to the will of God because he knows that all of this is, that he's going through is really, at the bottom line of it, 
is his fault. Amen. Because it's because of his sins. And so David says, now I'm not going to fight Absalom and we're not going to put Jerusalem through a siege. I'm going to go ahead and leave. So we've been talking about this flight. We also saw how David, amen, had people go with him. The Cherethites, the Pelethites, the Headlights, the Good Knights, <laughs> the Flashlights, amen. He took a whole bunch of lights with him, amen. And uh, these represented Gentiles, some of them. And we, we focus in on one of the Gentiles, a man by the name of Ittai, and how sweet a spirit Ittai had. Because he told David, he said, David, listen, I'm not leaving you. You know, I'm going with you, and if you die, I'm going to die there with you. And it was him talking to David, amen, almost quoting the book of Ruth, which was David's great-grandmother. And when David had no fortune, no fame, when his life was in danger, Ittai stayed with him. Amen. And he told David, pretty much, I'm with you till the wheels fall off. And we say, we're looking for Ittai's. Amen. We say, God is looking for Ittai's. Amen. Not no fair weather saints or fair weather friends. So tonight, y'all, we're going to continue. And we're going to talk about David's flight part two. And we'll start at verse 23. And we're just going to roll and see where we stop. All right. Let's look at verse 23. The Bible says, and all the country wept with a loud voice and all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook Kidron and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. The Bible starts off verse 23 saying that all the country wept. This means that, hallelujah, the people of God <clears throat> who were living on the countryside of Jerusalem, they were living in the rural areas around the city. They wept, they cried, amen, when they saw the king flee in the city. They cried because, y'all, besides the issue with Bathsheba, David was a righteous king. He was way more righteous than Saul, amen. He was the best king that they had up until this point, all right? And what Israel don't know at this time, he will be the best king that they ever had, amen. Not that he was perfect. He messed up with Bathsheba. But he was still the man after God's own heart. Amen. Why do you think they call Jesus the son of David? All right. All right. Uh, and so they wept for him. He was a glorious king. All right. He had blessed the people so much. If we would go back and talk about the way Israel was before David and the way Israel now is now after David is two completely different pictures. Before David, the Philistines, amen, pretty much ruled Israel. If you remember, a hey God, some of them couldn't even have weapons, make swords. They took out all the blacksmiths, amen. The Philistines was running business. In fact, Israel didn't have Jerusalem. They didn't have the Ark of the Covenant with them, amen. Hallelujah. It was just a messed up situation. They wasn't free like we just talked about. They wasn't free to worship like we've been singing. And that was all during the judges and Saul, amen. It wasn't the same Israel. When David came on the scene, David beat down all the enemies around him. David fought and captured Jerusalem again. And David brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David. And Israel was free, saints. So when the Bible said that the country wept, that's why they was crying. They was crying. They knew Absalom was coming, amen, but there was no way to guarantee that Absalom would be better than what they already had, all right? You know, there's an old saying that you never miss a good thing till it's gone. And I could feel some of them thinking that. They were with Absalom, yeah, Absalom, yeah, Absalom, but when they actually watched David leave, they probably was like, huh, y'all sure y'all doing the right thing, you know? And in reality, they should have weep, amen, because they wasn't doing the right thing. You know, I think about Jesus, amen, because they did the same thing to Jesus, huh? When they rejected him and the women was crying and Jesus said, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself because y'all the one making the wrong decision, not me. And so the son of David, hallelujah, Jesus is taking the same trek, the same road, the same journey as King David. Being rejected of his own. Amen. And so the people wept. Let's continue. 
The Bible says, and all the people passed over. All this means is that all the servants of David, including Ittai, they were all leaving the city and passing over into what the Bible calls the wilderness. The Bible says, the king also himself passed over this special place. It calls it the Brook Kidron. Somebody say, Brook Kidron. They had to pass the brook Kidron and all the people passed over this brook toward the way of going to the wilderness. Now, saints, here's a little geography for you. When you leave Jerusalem and you go to the east towards the Mount of Olives, there was a valley that you had to cross. This valley was the valley of Kidron. In the valley was a small stream, a small ravine. In that valley with the stream in it, all the way at the bottom of it was called the Brook Kidron. I got a little, another little map for you. This one kind of shows, hallelujah, uh, Jerusalem uh, with the brook, the, the valley around it. This is an actual picture of the valley. You have the city on this side. Jerusalem is on a mountain, saints. And around that mountain, what we would call Mount Zion, all right, is actually on seven mountains if you study your Bible. But around the city are valleys, making it pretty much impervious to enemies to come and attack it. Because you not only have to go up a mountain to attack Jerusalem, you got to go through a valley to get to those mountains. And so one of the valleys that surround Jerusalem is this Valley Kidron. This is a picture of it. That little uh, building right there is called Absalom's Tomb that they put. That's a present day picture. Go ahead and flip me another pic. Amen. That's another shot of it, looking down into the valley. And in the wintertime, you see that at, at the bottom of that valley, it floods with water. And so sometimes you'll have water in that. So when the Bible says that David passed over, he was passing over this brook Kidron. And obviously at the time, it probably had water in it. You got another pick for me? Hallelujah. Go to another one. Let's see if you got another one. Nope. Nope. That's it. All right. That's the brook Kidron. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let's talk about this thing a little bit. The Brook Kidron is what separated the Mount of Olives and Jerusalem. All right. This brook uh, held in it the waste, the refuse, the trash of the city. All right. Anything that was in the city that didn't belong in the city that was unclean. They threw it in the Brook Kidron, all right? It was the trash pile, the dump of the city of Jerusalem. Even when they killed animals in the temple, all the blood and the parts of the animals, they would put it in the Kidron Valley. If somebody died and they didn't really know who it was, guess where they would put the body at? In the Kidron Valley. This was the unclean place outside the gate of the city, outside the wall. Even the name Kidron means black, dark, gloomy, refuse, rejection, you see. Another name for the Kidron Valley is the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Somebody say Valley of Jehoshaphat. You see, this is all deep stuff that we're talking about here. This valley is associated in our Bible consistently with hard times, with dark times with troubled times. It's always associated, when we look at it in our Bible, with judgment, with suffering, you see, with rejection, you see. Let's look at a few scriptures right off the bat. The Valley of Kidron is associated with suffering. In John chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus crossed this same brook, y'all. Jesus crossed this brook while he was on his way to Gethsemane for the final time. This is right before the cross. This is right before Judas sells him out. He's, he's, he's gone to Gethsemane, but he has to cross the brook Kidron. The Bible says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. Y'all remember what happened in that, 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 that Gethsemane, Gethsemane? Huh? When Jesus told his disciples, pray, lest you enter into temptation. 
Y'all pray here, and I'm going to go pray over there. All right? And them boys tried to pray, but the atmosphere was too heavy. It wasn't because they was tired, no. It was the spiritual atmosphere. The forces of light and the forces of darkness was meeting head on, saints, at this moment. All right? And Jesus is about to go to the cross and die for the sins of all mankind. So we got a lot of things going on in the spirit in Gethsemane. You understand what I'm saying? It's so heavy for Jesus. Jesus looks up to the Father and says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. If it's possible. Because Jesus is dealing so, with so much. He's dealing with Judas that's going to betray him. He's dealing with the cross that he's going to have to endure. He knows every nail that's going to go in him, every, every lash on his back. He knows all of this, and he got to deal with all of that. All right? When you cross the Kadron, amen, it's a place of suffering. All right? And David is going through the same thing. David is suffering here, saints. He might not be suffering like Christ, but he's suffering. They betrayed him, his own son betrayed him. They rejected him, his own people rejected him. He loses everything, he don't have his castle no more, he's not the king anymore, his fame is gone, his fortune is gone, it's sad, they're crying, it's sad. And he has this, all of this on his heart as he's crossing the Kadron. It's a place of suffering. Anybody ever crossed the Kidron Valley before? Any, anybody ever been in a heavy place before? You know, a suffering place before? That's where David is. That's what Kidron is all about. The valley of Kidron is not only a place of suffering, but it's a place of judgment. It's a place of judgment. You not only suffer there, but God judges you there. Right, I'm going to bring you to a scripture, amen, that's really heavy, but don't forget what we're talking about, judgment, all right? In Joel chapter 3, verse 1, amen, Kidron is such a place of judgment. Do you not know that the last judgment itself is going to take place in this valley of Jehoshaphat? The final judgment. I'm talking about the great white throne. I'm talking about when God come to judge the nations, all right? Kadron is going to be that place, all right? Look with me at Joel 3.1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, just wait right there one second. We're talking about the final judgment, but here in, here in this verse alone, we got a Hebrew nugget in this verse. Joel is prophesying the final judgment. But look what happens right before the final judgment. He says, I'm going to bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. When he says, I'm going to bring the captivity again, it, 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 it doesn't mean that he's going to lock them up again. Look at that in the NLT. Amen. I think I have that for you in, in the NLT. The NLT says it like this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here it is. It's coming. He says, well, behold, in those days and that time when I shall, he says, when I restore the prosperity of Judah and Jerusalem. This is the last days. This is Joel's last days prophecy. Verse 1 is telling us he's not, he's not going to bring us into captivity again. He's going to bring us out of captivity. That's what that Hebrew language is saying. He's going to bring us out of captivity. At that time. At the time of those events, says the Lord, when I restore the prosperity of who? Of Judah and Jerusalem. Anybody want prosperity restored to them? All right? That's last days. All right? I just had to get that out. Look at verse 2. I will also gather all nations and bring them down into where? The valley of Jehoshaphat. Last days. Last days. Last days, I'm going to bring him to the valley of Jehoshaphat. All right. Now, what is, he's going, what, what is he going to gather them for? All right. I will plead with them. Why? For my people and for my heritage. I'm going to deal with the nations for how they've treated my people. 
So we say, why is it important to know who the people are? So you can watch how you treat them. Because God said, in the final judgment, I'm going to deal with all the nations for how they dealt with my people. Well, God, what did they do to your people? Huh? He said, well, listen, he said they have scattered them among the nations. And we know who they're talking about because, listen, hey, God, the Ashkenazis travel around the world because they want to. Only one people were scattered because they didn't want. They were put on both. They went. They were scattered among the nations. You see? And what did they do to the land? They parted my land, God said. They gave my people land to somebody else. They parted my land, God said. So when we think of the final judgment, we think it's only God dealing with, hallelujah, people with the individual sins, but he's going to be dealing with how the nations treated the Hebrews, how, he treat, how they treated Israel. Is that not what the Bible says in him? Look what he said in verse 3. And they have cast lots for my people, all right, and have given a bar for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. All the commentators agree that God is talking about slavery and selling boys and selling girls, using as though it were, amen, them for bartering, for, 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 for this and for that. That's slavery he's talking about. And what the Hebrews, the, the Negroes don't understand is that God is going to deal with nations for that. He's going to deal with them for that. It's going to be part of the judgment. You know? Hallelujah. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, Assemble yourselves and come, all you heathen. Gather yourselves together round about. Cause your mighty ones to come down. Call all your biggest, baddest soldiers. Because I'm going to call my biggest, baddest soldiers, God say. In verse 12, Let the heathen be awakened, the Gentiles, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their, their wickedness is green. Verse 14, how it's going to look, God? Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. He's talking about that valley Kidron. It's a valley of decision. It's a valley of judgment. Is the valley of Jehoshaphat. The Bible says on that day, the sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the true children of Israel. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. All right. This Kidron Valley is a valley of judgment, saints. That's what it is. God judges people there. Right? And in the last days, amen, a great judgment is going, hallelujah, happen there. And those that know their Bible, when you read Revelations 19, you understand, amen, that this is what the Lord is talking about. When all the nations of the earth gather together to make war against the Lord and his Christ, when he come down, amen, on that white horse, with the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, amen. And we already know from the book of Zechariah exactly where he's going to touch down. He's going to touch down on what? The Mount of Olives. Well, guess what's right in front of the Mount of Olives? The Valley of Jehoshaphat. You see? The Kidron Valley. It's all going to happen right there. And he's going to judge the nations for how they treated his people. You know? Kidron is a place of judgment. Well, Pastor, how does this relate to our text? Well, as David's crossing the Kidron Valley, David is being judged by God. You see? Everything he's going through is judgment. What is he being judged for? Well, murder, adultery, deception, ungratefulness. You see? A myriad of different sins that David is being judged for. But he's being judged, saints. You know? Whenever God begins to judge you, or some Christians like to use the word chasten, when he began to put that rod on you for something you've done wrong, 
than you in Kidron. Amen? Anybody experienced chastisement before? Anybody done something wrong and God put it on you before? All right? That's when you're in the brook Kidron. All right? I don't know about you, but I done been there before. All right? When God chastens his people. It's not always bad when God chastens you. Amen? Sound boot. Look up Hebrews 12 and 5 for me. You see? It's not bad when God chasing you. It's a good thing when he chasing you. You know? When you're doing wrong and God put his hands on you, listen, it means that God loves you when he do that. Amen? All right? Actually, what he's putting David through to have to leave his own palace, to have to leave as though it were the city that he founded and won for the people, to have to leave all of that, listen, let me tell you, he's putting David through chastisement. And you know why he's putting David through chastisement? Because he wants to make sure that the mistake David made, that he'll never make it again. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? How many people know that you can cross that Kidron? Amen? And, and, and God allow you to go through some things because of your actions. That'll teach you a lesson for the rest of your life. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? And the Bible tells us, amen, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Don't be mad when God discipline you. When he judge what you're doing that's wrong, don't get mad at God. He say, he say faint not. No, take it. Take it from God. Be a man about your business. Be a woman about your business because you was a man when you was doing wrong. Now be a man when you get dealt with for the wrong that you've done. All right? He said, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Look at the next verse in verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourged every son whom he received. Listen, for God to put David through what David has gone through at that brook is because he loves David. Yeah. I'm telling you, to, uh, for him to allow David's own son to betray his own son. You know how that must feel? And not just his own son, no. That was his favorite son. Because if you got an old son that you don't really, you know, anyway, but, but if you got, if it's, it's your favorite one that stabbed you in the back, all right, that's got to hurt, all right? But sometimes, y'all, we can't learn but by the school of hard knocks. Sometimes pain is the only instructor that we're going to listen to. The Bible try to tell us, pastor preach it, first lady come preach it, amen, and nobody won't listen. And God say, I got somebody they're going to listen to. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're going to listen to chastisement. They're going to listen to pain. You know, that's Kidron, man. That's judgment. And when you cross that thing, you know you're crossing it. And God is trying to produce something in you that when you cross it, by the time you get to the other side, you're a different person. You're a different person. Amen? All the times God dealt with Jacob, y'all, all the times. And Jacob continued to lie and continued to manipulate and continued to force his way in places that, hallelujah, either wasn't for him or it wasn't his time just yet. Jacob caused him trouble everywhere. He caused trouble everywhere until one night he wrestled with God. Woo! And when he wrestled with God, the Bible said God touched his hip. And when he got up from wrestling with God, he, did, he never walked the same. He, 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 he changed. Hey, God. They even began to call him a different name. They say, your name not Jacob no more. You're Israel because you went through something. You went through Kedron and you came out a different person. So different. Your walk is different. Your talk is different. Your name is different. You're no longer supplanter, but you're Israel. You're a prince with God now. All right? That's what Kedron will do for you. You know? But nobody want to cross it. Nobody want to cross it. Nobody want the pain. You know? They used to tell us in football or in sports, li listen, sometimes no pain is no gain, saints. You see? It's the pain that's going to take you to another level. Yeah, Kadron was a suffering place, but it was a suffering place with a purpose of judgment. I'm going to get you for what you did, all right? But it was also a cleansing place, all right? 
And, and through the spirit, I kind of covered some of that in point B, but we're going to talk about it. It was a cleansing place. You see, like I told you, saints, whenever something was dirty in the city, where they threw it at? Kadron. It was to handle everything that was unclean, all the garbage, all the trash, all right? In fact, when King Asa, King Hezekiah, and King Josiah became king of Israel, each of them had to go through Israel and tear down the idols in the groves that Israel had built. When they took all the false gods that Israel had, where do you think they put those false gods at? In the brook Kedron? That's right. In 1 Kings, hallelujah, 15, 11, the Bible says, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. As did who? David, his father. Is David Asa's father? No, nah, he's his father as far as, amen, his ancestor. All right? He, 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 Asa is in his lineage. All right? But look how Dave, God sees David. He did everything that was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father, David. You see? You see, when you sin, but you really repent of your sins, when you really repent, when you really give that thing to God, amen, and God receives and forgives you, amen, when God forgives you, it's almost like you never did it before. So when God sees David, amen, uh, rarely does he ever bring up the issue of Bathsheba. He said, Asa did what was right. How? Huh? As did David his father. Anyway, that was just a little, some good on actual true repentance. All right? Though your sins be red as scarlet, God will wash them as white as snow. In verse 12, what did Asa do? He took away what? The Sodomites. Pastor, what's the Sodomites? Huh? Well, one of the first things Asa did to bring Israel back into revival, he took away homosexuality from the city, from Israel, from the country. All right? Then what did he do? And remove what? All the idols that his father had made. Verse 13. And also Makkah, his mother, his own mama was in idolatry. What did he do to her? He removed her from being queen. Mama, I love you, but you're not right. And you got to go. That's how Asa was rolling. Because she made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol. And where he put those idols at? And he burned it where? By the brook Kidron. You see? And if we had time, we would go through. Hezekiah did the same thing. And Josiah did the exact same thing. You see, Kidron is not only a place of suffering, a place of judgment, but it's a place of purification. God is going to purify David, y'all. All right? He's going to purify David. Look at Hebrews 12, 11. All right? And I know I kind of talked about it already in the B point, but we're going to look at Hebrews 12, 11. Hallelujah. Sound boot, I didn't give you that, but can you put that up? Hebrews 12, 11. All right? And, 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 and verse 11 is, is, is kind of simple. If you got your Bible, you can actually turn to it. It's when God said, now, no chastening for the moment, amen, uh, 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 seems to be joyous. You know the one he talked about that? He said, he say, but it's actually grievous when the Lord is on you, when he's putting it on you. That is, he said, no chastening for the moment, you see, for the present, seeming to be joyous. When God decides to chasten you, you're not going to be happy about it. Ain't nobody got a whipping that they was happy about it. But how that whipping going to feel? It's going to be grievous, he said. He said, nevertheless. Somebody say, nevertheless. nevertheless. You see, when he whip you, it hurt. But he got a nevertheless then. Amen. What the whipping going to do? Afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of what? Of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. All right? Judgment, suffering, and purity. That's what God is working in Kidron. Listen, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but there's somebody going through tonight. They're suffering tonight. And their suffering could be because of their own actions. All right? They're in Kidron right now, a bad place. And you want to give up. 
You want to be mad at God and you want to be mad at the world. All right. The first thing you got to do is, number one, be mad at yourself. All right. Because you're the one put yourself in that situation. If it was up to God, you would not be in Kadron. All right. David would still be in the palace if it was up to God. No, you went play with that woman. All right. Not God. All right. And all God doing is putting you through something to get this thing out of you. So you won't mess with nobody else, woman, and you won't kill nobody else's husband. All right. After God finishes with David, David going to say to himself, and all this was because I was looking at a woman taking a bath from my rooftop and wanted a little conversation. I bet you David don't talk to no women. <laughs> he don't even go on his rooftop. And if he smell olive oil, he going to go on vacation and leave the city. Listen to me. But that's what happens when God deal with you on an issue. You don't even want to be around it no more. All right. So though you can't see it and you're struggling and you're going through, God is going to work such a work through this thing. Amen. That he's going I'm telling he's going to bring forth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You know what I'm saying? But he got to bring you to Kendron to do it. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. In fact, I think that the Hebrews, amen, in America, in our current situation, we are in our Kendron right now. We're in a suffering place, but it's our own fault, so it's because of judgment. Amen. But in that place, he is purifying us. Anybody heard me, huh? All right. So that when we leave Kadron, we will never be the same again. We will not reject him again. We won't ask for nobody but him no more. Amen. We're going to be yoked to him. Amen. How many Hebrews agree with me? Amen. That they not ever turning back from the most high God. No, we can't go back, saints. That's only because of Kadron. All right. Now, let's continue with verse 24. We're going to just keep going since we have time. All right. In verse 24, we introduce to another character like Ittai. The Bible says, and lo, Zadok. Somebody say Zadok. Zadok also. And all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God. And Abathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. I love this dude, Zadok. Zadok is another guy like Ittai. Zadok represents the mercy of God to David. Because though David going through, God will always put good people on the side of you to help you go through. He's not going to just let you go through without somebody to help you along the way. Amen. Might be that brother or that sister that pick you up out of nowhere, that friend that call you, amen. Might be that pastor, that first lady, amen, that 12 leader. But though you're going through, God's always going to have somebody there. Because remember, he's never going to test you or tempt you more than you can bear. He's always going to remember mercy and judgment, amen. So with David, he had it tied there. And he has that out there as well. And it's such an amazing blessing. The Bible says in Zadok, also, now Zadok is the son of Ahitub. Ahitub, Ahitub was a descendant of Aaron, and so they Levites. All right, uh, 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 and the Bible says, and Zadok and all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. So David is leaving the city, and Zadok is leaving too. The only problem is, is that Zadok leaves. He comes. He follows David, and he brings all the Levites with him. All the Levites with him. What's the problem with all the Levites leaving Jerusalem? Well, if all the Levites leave Jerusalem, well, they cannot operate their religious system. Because you can't sacrifice without a Levite. You can't worship without the Levite. Amen. You can't go into the Holy of Holies. Amen. There's no Judaism without the Levites. So when David leaves the city, Zadok and all the Levites go with him. All right. Anybody hear me up in here? That's the problem that the Ashkenazis have, right? They want to rebuild the temple, but they don't have no Levites. The temple without the Levites is nothing. 
Because ain't nobody can do nothing for God in the temple but the Levites. All right? The Levites came with Zadok. And what were they carrying? They were bearing what? They were carrying what? They were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They learned from when Uzzah died. They didn't put it on a cart no more, all right? Wherever the ark went, the Levites carried it, all right? So we have here David leaving the city. Zadok is going with him. All the Levites are leaving as well. And they also taking what? The ark of the covenant. Now, what does the ark of the covenant represent? The ark of the covenant represents the very presence of God. It was built to the, spe uh, the, the specifics that God intended. Hallelujah. He put two cherubim on the top and he says, I'm the one that dwell between the cherubims. Amen. This is called the mercy seat. All right. And you say, well, I thought God said, don't make an image of him. This is not an image of him. This is an image of his throne. Amen. Because he's in between the cherubim that's saying, holy, holy, holy. Amen. There's no image of God on that ark. Amen. It represented his presence, though. And every, anywhere the ark was, it represented that the presence of God was there. Amen. And so when David leaves, hey, God, Zadok leaves, the Levites leave, and guess what else leaves? The ark leaves. Woo! God, it's like the presence leaves. How in the world are you going to have a religious system with no Levites, no ark, no presence? Is Ichabod. Anybody hear me up in here? It's all leaving with David. You see? And so the Bible says in Zadok and all the Levites that were with him bearing the ark of God. And they set down the ark of God. You see? And Abathar, which was the high priest, that was David's boy, amen, went up until all the people had done passing. Look at 25. Y'all still up out there? The Bible says, and the king said unto Zadok, carry back the ark of God into the city. I'm going to read that again. This is big right here. This is big right here. He told Zadok, he said, carry back the ark of God into the city. All right? This is big right here. You see, Jen and Jenna, the ark was so important to David. Just to give you a mindset of where David was and his relationship with the ark and what it represented. All right? David didn't rest after he took Jerusalem until he got the ark, amen, from where it was to Jerusalem. He didn't rest, all right? And the first time he tried, he failed. A man died with David trying to bring the ark. Did David quit? Uh-uh. The ark is too important. Let's just do it again. But let's do it again in decency and in all, all right? And so David was sacrificing animals, amen, in front of the ark as the ark was coming in. I'm talking about, listen, uh, cattle for days, just killing stuff, sacrificing stuff to the most high God. And then the ark meant so much to David, till David began to break it down in front of the ark. Y'all remember that? David danced in front of the ark. He danced so hard, he burned up his first wife. Anybody hear me up in here? And she was never the same because of David dancing and playing before the Lord. That's how much the ark meant to David. When they built David's house, anybody hear me up in here? David said, look at me in this palace. How can I live in this palace surrounded by all this brick and stone and the ark of God is living in tents? The dude was obsessed with the presence. That's why he's probably one of the greatest worshipers to ever live. You see? He was obsessed with the presence of God, with the ark of the most high. He loved it. You know what I'm saying? David said, better is one day in your house than thousands elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. He wanted to be close to the presence, T. He said, man, you know what I'm saying? He was jealous of the birds that was in the temple. I just got to be where you are. I want to be where you are. That's how David felt about the ark. But look at this statement in this verse that David makes, which is completely contradictory to how he feels. Of course he wants the ark with him. But David says, Zadok, carry back the ark of God. Where, David? Into the city. Into the city. Why would David say that? 
Why would David say that? You see, David understood, y'all, that if there was no ark in Israel, there would be no God in Israel. There'd be no faith in Israel. There'd be no religion in Israel. There'd be no Judaism in Israel. Yeah, I want the ark close to me, but what about my nation? Where they going to worship at? Where they, where, where they going to go at? They're they not going to be able to go on the holy of holies. They won't be able to hey, celebrate in the holy place. They won't be able to be in the outer courts. It's going to be meaningless without the presence there. David said, yeah, I want it by me. But bring it back into the city. Bring it, bring it back into the city. Listen, this is big, saints. For David to be godly in Kedron, for David to be godly while suffering, while being judged, hey, while being purified, for him to be godly and selfless and still thinking about the people who rejected him and chose Absalom before him, this is whoo, it's humongous, y'all. What you trying to say, Pastor? While you suffer, watch how you act. All right? Because somebody else is watching. All right? And it means a lot to God. If you could still be godly through an adverse situation. It, it means so much to God when they're doing you wrong and you could still be thinking about them. I don't know who I'm talking to in here tonight. I don't know who getting done wrong. I don't know. But, but when God looked down and he see that. A blessing is on the way. A blessing is on the way. When you can be good to people that's wrong to you, a blessing is on the way. David, David said, take it back. In the you know how bad he wanted that off with him? Take it back. Take it back in the city. They need it more than me. Look what he says in verse 25, he says, if I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord. Boy, David is a fool, I tell you what. He knows God so well, saints. You know, my wife say my daughters know me like that. They know what to ask me and they know what to ask her. <laughs> I'm watching y'all. Do you have a relationship with your heavenly father? Where you know, amen, how to touch his heart. You know what to say. You know when to say it. You know how to say it. Do you know his character well enough mm, that the words you frame woo, on earth make a difference in heaven? David says something so profound here. He says, if I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it, the ark, and his habitation. I'm going to see the ark. I'm going to see the tabernacle, everything. I'll see it all. I don't need to keep it with me because if God be for me, who could be against me? And if, he, if I got favor with God, he's going to bring me back. Now, now, if you think selflessness gets God excited, when you begin to exalt him, his power, his sovereignty, and you talk faith. Hey, God, he able to bring me back. He able. God is, is able. David knew that God loved faith talk. God, it just, it, it do something to God. It, he remembered when he was in the valley and he told that, 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 he told that giant, he said, yeah, you, you coming in the name of this, but I'm coming in the hall, the name of my God, the God of Israel. And, and that, that just get God, God up there like, yeah. You ain't got to fight at all, David. Because you're, you're speaking my language. You know? In marriage, I'm, I'm getting male. In marriage, uh, 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 the five love language book, teach us that our spouse has certain love language. And people have different love languages. Some people like when you buy them gifts. Other people like when you spend time with them. Other people like when you use words of affirmation and you encourage them. 
all right? Uh, uh, some people like you to serve them and work for them and things of that nature. Amen. You cut the grass, you wash their car. The goal of it is you got to find your spouses or your future spouse. You got to find out what's their love language. All right. Because when you find out their love language, hey, God, you can make them the happiest, amen, person on the face of the planet because... That love language is what they need. It's nothing, nothing that will hurt a marriage more. When you're washing the car and cutting the grass and doing all the work, but that's not even her love language. Yeah. She just wants you to talk to her. Yeah. She just wants you to just sit down and, <laughs> baby, look how, how nice your hair look. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, 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 here it is. You, you making a whole bunch of money to buy gifts and stuff like that. And cost. she's not even into that type of stuff. Her love language is for you to be at home spending quality time with her. But you, you said, I want to make a whole bunch of money to buy her thing. She don't care about what you buy her. She wants you to be with her. So, just a little bit of nugget for Friday night. Look, listen. Love language. But don't you know that even your kids have a love language? You figure out what they need, whether it's uh, uh, affection, a hug, words of affirmation, you can do it. You know what I'm saying? Quality time, let's go on a date. You know what I'm saying? All right? Your kids have a, a love language. Your spouse has a love language. Let me tell you who else got a love language. God. God got a love language. God got a love language. All right? All right? Now, if you ask me, he operated in almost all of them, all right? But what David is tapping into is these words of affirmation. If he will just favor me, I know, hey, he will bring me back. And I'm going to see he's powerful enough. He's strong enough. He's sovereign enough. He's the God that controls everything. I believe in him. And even though I'm way down here and I don't have nothing, I still trust him. Though he slay me, yet still will I trust. When you begin to speak unto God, those words unto the Lord, hey, God will move heaven and earth for you. It's like a man that likes encouragement. Some of you men have the love language of, hallelujah, of encouragement. And you give that man the right words of affirmation and encouragement, that man will go out and pick a car up for you. Hey, God. And, and Kelly will probably do that for you, Chance. I'm saying he's strong enough. Hallelujah. He's still not faster than me, but I'm just saying. Listen. Hey, God. So, woman of God, you too. Just that, just that, honey, you look nice tonight. You know, I really appreciate how you work hard like that. You know, you know, you, you make sure our car's always nice, and, and I appreciate that. I I like the way you don't run the streets, amen, because down here they run the street all the time and you're not in no club and I appreciate, you know what that do to that man? Every time you say something, that man just go up. Pop. You know what I'm saying? Where we at, y'all? All right, all right. David is doing that to God. He's doing that to God. That's why God loved praise. It's a love language. That's why he liked worship. We tell him, him his word. It's, it's words of affirmation. And here we have David doing that. And, and David is, man, listen, man. Look at it in the NIV. Let's just look at it. Take the ark back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it in his dwelling place again. This just set the Lord on fire. All right? But let me tell you another thing that David did that just set the Lord on fire. Through this whole experience with Kadron, David, I'm telling you, he, he, ooh. <laughs> Some people go through and they don't know how to go through and they wind up making God more upset with them on, while they're going through. While David goes through, he makes God love him more. If that's possible, you know, you know what I'm saying. He, 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 what I'm saying is, it's hard to put in words. He knows how to go through with God. He don't get further from God. He get closer to God. Look, look I'm telling you, look at verse 26. Now this, this is another level, John. Oh yeah, this is another level, right? Look what he said. 
But if he, that's God, thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here am I. Let him do to me as seem it good unto him. Now that, oh, if you think selflessness, bring the ark back. If you think faith and words of encouragement, he could bring me back. If you think that excites God, if you tell God, God, I'm yours. You do what you want to do. And after you do you, I'm going to be happy with whatever you do. Because, hey, God, I'm your servant. I'm your man. You just do you. Hey, God have mercy. This, this, this is typical Jesus right here. Take this cup from me, Lord. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Even on that cross, if you decide it's going to bring you glory, I will go through that cross. I will go through Kedron. I, woo, don't he slay me? Yes, still, when you start talking that stuff like that, when you tell God, you God, and I'm just a man, you do what you want to do. That, that just set David in a whole different place. And let me tell you, right after David do those things for God, God can't help but to move for David. All right? And, and you go home and read it. You're going to see David do little things. And then you're going to see God move. And we're going to study that every Tuesday from here on out. I showed you a few little things. The selflessness, the, the faith, and the words of affirmation. And then this, this, this submission to the sovereignty of Almighty God. God loves that stuff, man. Look what David, look what God does for David in 27. He gives David wisdom. Anybody need wisdom in a tough situation? Anybody need wisdom while you're suffering? Amen. Look what he gives to David. David does something that's so wise, it's got to come from God. The king said also to Zadok the priest, Art not thou a seer? You're a prophet, huh, Zadok? He said, yeah, I'm a prophet. Return into the city in peace. Don't make no beef, no problems with Absalom. Just go back to the city in peace. They need the ark. They need a Levite there to worship Go back in peace. And while you're there, you and your two sons, with Ahamas, thy son, and Jonathan, son of Abathar, he said, y'all go back. In verse 28, see, I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness until there come word from you to certify me. Yeah. Meaning that I'm going to let the ark go back. I'm allowed the Levites to go back. They're going to go, yeah, y'all go, they're going to have a worship system. But they're going to do something for me as well. He said, I'm going to be in the wilderness, in the desert. But I'm going to be waiting for a word from you, Zadok, to certify me. You're going to report to me. You're going to give me information what's going on in the kingdom. You're going to tell me the movements and the whereabouts of Absalom and where his army is and where his army not. Hey, God, anything that's going on in the kingdom, you're going to be my eyes and ears in the kingdom. You're going to be my CIA. You're going to be my FBI. You're going to be my spy. Amen. You see, because sometimes when you do God right, God's going to give you wisdom. And part of that wisdom is God putting you, a man, right by the devil camp so he could hear what the devil going to do. For he never does anything without his prophets knowing that I'm trying to he told that I go ahead this right here is actually going to save David's life you see look what he said he says here yeah, I don't know where I'm at now but let's. we almost done alright you're going to be my informer look at 29 we're going to cover 29, and then that's going to be it. 29. Zadok, therefore, and Abiathar carried the ark of God, where? Again to Jerusalem. And they did what? And they tarried there. This is big. This is big. Why is it so big, Pastor? Well, it was big to David for David to submit to the sovereignty of God. 
But it was big for Zadok to submit to David. All right? All right? But what we need to learn is, is that whatever you do to God, God going to make people around you do the same thing to you. All right? So when you submit to God, mm, Hey, it ain't going to be no thing for the wife to submit at home and the children going to submit at home. And it just flows because you're in order. The order is there. You see, when you're out of order, David not submitting to God, then nothing else going to submit. Zadok obeyed David. This is big. This is big. You see, I'm telling you here that it's big because Zadok don't want to be with Absalom. He want to be with David. He don't want to be in Jerusalem. He want to be in the wilderness with David. You see, because sometimes when you meet a man of God, you'd rather be in the wilderness with a man of God than in the Hilton with the sons of hell. You understand what I'm saying? So, so he like, Zadok like, I don't want to go. You know what I'm saying? This is the reason why we walk all this way carrying the ark, knowing that any time one of us could be electrocuted by this thing. You know what I'm saying? We traveled all this way with this thing because we want to be with you, David. All right? And David is saying, I understand where you want to be, but that's not where I need you right now. Oh, God have mercy. That's not where I need you right now. You see? When David said go back, the Bible say Zadok returned. And he tarried there. He stayed there. And he did exactly what David wanted. You see? This is big because the same way we need Ittai's in the world, we need some Zadok's in the world as well. People who are willing to say, I know what I want, but I'm going to get where you need me to be. <laughs> Woo! I know what I want, but I'm going to get where you need me to be. That's what Zadok's heart was. Zadok represents the friend that will love you even when they don't understand what, what you're doing. They, 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 they don't understand everything you're doing, but they, I, I'm with you. I love you. I trust you. I might not agree, but I'm going to do what you told me. All right? That's Zadok to David. All right? The friend that will stick out his neck for you. And risk hurting, him, hurting himself to stand with you. You see? For Zadok to go into the city again and be a spy, that's risking his own life. And David told him, I, I want to be with you, David. No, go back in the city. All right. But Absalom could find out that I'm still with you. But they could figure out I'm sending messengers to you. A Zanak is somebody who's going to roll with you even though they're risking some things themselves. Greater love had no man than this. Yeah. Than a man would lay down his life. For a friend. You see, when we look at Ittai and Zadok, the Bible is trying to teach us what kind of friends we should be. A friend that's not selfish, but selfless. That I'm not only going to ride with you till the wheels fall off, but if they fall off and I got to get under there, hey, God, and help you put them back on. I know the car could fall on me, but I'm so down with you that if I got to get myself bruised up, scarred up, hey, God, we just going to get scarred up together. A Zadok. Somebody that's not only just selfish about it. You see? Two men went camping. All right? Let me soften it up. They see a grizzly bear approaching. And one of them runs to his bag and put on his tennis shoes. The other, the other man said, what you doing putting on your tennis shoes? He said, I'm about to run. He said, don't you know you can't outrun a grizzly bear? You think run 30, 35 miles per hour. All right? His boy with the tennis shoes said, I don't have to outrun him. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> he can only eat one of us at a time. 
And if he get you, I'm home free. <laughs> treat, treat. That's the friends we used to have. That's the friends we used to have. Selfish and not selfless. You see? That's not Zadok. Zadok went right in there. Now, now I'm concluding. Look, let, let's, let, look, look. Pastor, who do I be a Zadok to? All right? Number one, you be a Zadok to God. God, I know what I want to do in church. I know what I want to do in my life, in my dreams, and where, where I want to work, where, even where I want to live, God. I know all of these things about me and what I want. But if you need me to be any place else, <laughs> I'm going to put my plans and my dreams on the side for you, Most High, because I love you that much. I will be a Zadok unto you. You know what that word Zadok means? That name Zadok means righteous. You understand what I'm saying? Because that's the heart of the righteous. Not my will, but your will be done. You be a Zadok unto God. And God, no matter if I risk some things, if I lose a little money listening to you, it don't matter, God. If I, if I have to get a salary decrease, it don't matter, God. If I got to put my degree on the side and work in another field, it don't matter, God. If I got to move in this neighborhood when I know I can qualify, it don't matter, God. If I got to work in the nursery when I know I'm supposed to be on the pulpit, it don't matter, God. Wherever you need me, Daddy, that is where I'm going to be. That's the Zadox, saints. And you know that you could never give. You could never give God something. Where God don't repay you back a hundredfold. You see, I, 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 my, my Bible is all in my head because I can, I can fast forward in my Bible. Amen. Hallelujah. Past 2 Samuel, I can, I can go in my Bible and into the reign of, of Solomon and I can see that Zadok actually gets a promotion and moves up. Hey, God, for going down for God here, he gets a promotion and moves up right over there. Listen to me, good saints. Be a Zadok to God. Where you want me at? You see, because where you want to be is here. Where God put you is here. But what you don't know is, is that they got a back door to here. A secret stairwell that moves from here to there, or there to here, or wherever you are. So he'll know that Joseph has a desire to leave but he's going to put him in a prison. Not knowing that from the prison to the palace, there's a doorway, a stairway. There's a, a butler and a baker that get locked up. Ah, uh, oh, man. I, <laughs> I'm telling you like Mary told him, boy, whatever he say, do it. Just do it. You be a Zadok to God, but not only to God, no. Can I keep going just for a couple? Of? You be a Zadok, amen, woman of God, to your husband. All right? To your husband, woman of God. All right? You know what you want. All right? But you know where he needs you. He needs you. He needs you. At a certain place, a certain position, doing a certain thing. You know what you want, but when you can put on the side what you want. Hey! You're going to get blessed for that. I remember driving home from Baton Rouge. We making our list of our vision. Where we going to be five years, ten years, you know? And we laugh about it. We talk about the ministry, we say and everything like that. And she said, well, you know, I, I sure, I, you know, I'm not, you ain't going to be no pastor, that's what you <laughs> Don't you give that testimony? That's not what she wanted. And she was alone, that's not what I wanted. Because when we talk about our laugh, two pastors, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All 
All right? But when God called me, you can see pretty. When God called me, all right, all right, when God called me, I needed her in a certain place. All right? You understand what I'm saying? I needed her in a certain place. Come on, get down, man. You're looking way too pretty. Go ahead, get back, get back over there, get back over there. I'm trying to concentrate. Listen. I'm talking about your principal like that, huh? That's my wife, Jenna. Before she was your principal, that's my wife. That's my woman. Listen. So she put her plans on the side. You got to do that for your husband. And you're going to be blessed for that. Your calling is connected to his. If there's no connection between your callings, then, then something, something there. How can two walk together unless they agree? You got to figure out how it fit because it, it does fit. All right. All right, all right, come on, come on, come on. You got to be a Zadok young people to your parents. You know where you want to be and what you want to do, you know? But you got to say, Mom and Daddy, where you need me at? All right? Let me throw this one in. We wrapping it up. You got to be a Zadok to your pastor. Oh, I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that to your pastor, to your leaders of the church, first lady, the ministers, deacons, you got to be a Zadok to them. You know, because there's some things you want. Some things you want to do. Some positions that you see yourself in and maybe even could discern the future call of God there. All right? You want to be here. Hallelujah. But David come out and say, mm -mm. I need you. Over there. What you gonna do when your pastor say, uh uh? What you gonna do when one of the ministers say, uh uh? What you gonna do when deacons say, deacons say, uh uh? I know where you wanna be, but I need you to fulfill this mission of God. I really need you over there. Yeah, yeah, I need you over here. If you were that out, you know what I'm saying? You take a deep breath and count to 10. You do the salute, and you go to your position. You understand what I'm saying? You just never know that position that you go to might just have a back door to the position that you want. All right. Let me give you another one. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. You got to be a Zadok on your job when you go to work. Be a Zadok. Some of y'all going to work telling the boss what you're going to do and where you're going to be. And what. Ain't nothing a supervisor don't like more than that. Uh, uh, mm. A subordinate employee telling the boss what to do. You know what I'm saying? Because the boss take all the liability. The boss take all of the risk of paying everybody. The boss, hey amen, when it fall through, the boss going to be the one in blame. Now, if all that responsibility rests on the boss, why in the world are you going to try to come tell the boss what to do? You see, too much is given, much is required. You ain't been given nothing, and you ain't been required nothing. So why in the world are you the boss now? You got to be a Zadok on the job. Well, I want this position. All right, I understand that. But I need you over here in the corner back there where nobody see you. Because you're good making them paper jets that you make. And you make them paper jets and go ahead and put a little spit on there like you do. And do that. And do that well. And do it well. And you know what you do? Yeah. Because you never know way back there. <laughs> you never know being way back there in that closet where nobody see you. Where you don't get no type of, of praise or accolades for what you're doing. 
You never know that there's a God that sit high and look low. And the Bible say promotion don't come from the east or from the west or from the south. But promotion coming from the Lord. You just be a Zadok. And you're going to get to the place where you want to be. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. <coughs> Woo! Y'all, we covered a lot tonight. We got we to gotta quit. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Thank you for your people loving your word. And we talked about a lot tonight covering these scriptures. They're so rich, O King. But we pray, O King, that you would, Lord, use the scriptures to edify your body, build them up and encourage them and help them along the way, God. But Father, most of all, if there's somebody who don't know you, God, as we heard about Christ, hallelujah, going over to Brook Kadron, Lord, he did it, hallelujah, just like David did it. He suffered. He went through judgment. And he went through cleansing. But the judgment he went to wasn't for his sins. It was for ours. And the cleansing he experienced was not to cleanse him, but to cleanse us. Father, I pray somebody see Christ tonight. As they look at David, as they look at the suffering, as they think about Gethsemane, I pray they see Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Saints of God, the point of the story is, is that Christ suffered for you. And he died on the cross for you. He went over Kidron, but not for himself, but for you. Your sins required death. And Jesus died that death on your behalf. When he died, he was buried in a grave and he rose the third day. And when he rose, he said, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Tonight you could be saved. You just admit that you're a sinner. You believe in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection. And you open your mouth and you confess it. And you can be saved. It's just that easy. There's nothing magic about it. Salvation is as close as on your lips. You just got to open your mouth and believe in your heart. And God will save you. Pray with me now. Say, Father, Yahweh, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I know I messed up. I admit my sins, but I believe that you died for me on the cross. You were buried in a grave, and on the third day you rose. Lord, save me a sinner. I want to be ready, God, for that judgment day. I want to be forgiven. I want to be saved. You promised me that if I called on you, you would save me. I'm calling now. I believe that you cannot lie. So save me, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God some glory, saints. <laughs> Woo! We put that work in tonight. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bless you with peace, with shalom, with shalom. Kid Drown Valley don't last forever, and you're going to get a blessing on the other side. Love y'all, saints. Be blessed. Be blessed. Keep coming, my brother. Sweet spirit, take over this place. Take over this place. Sweet spirit, sweet spirit, take over this place. Take over, everybody say. Sweet!